All right, everyone. I have been working on a couple of videos on and off for the last four months or so. Some of you may have noticed my lack of output, but I assure you work it was happening in the background. One of these projects is my breakdown of rising star Adrian Yanez. That video is still in progress with an expected release date in October. While researching Yanez, I was completely struck by one of his opponents in the subject of today's video. Canvassing those I talked to about MMA, most remember the fight as a one-sided bludgeoning by Yanez, but the tape says differently. In the first round of their fight, Randy Costa put on the best performance I have ever seen Yanez face in the entirety of his career. To me, it is a crime that this was forgotten due to the outcome of the fight. In my opinion, Costa is a few tweaks away from consistently performing as a top 10 talent at bantamweight. The best part for Costa? These are not major overhauls, but rather minor tweaks that would pay huge dividends. Randy, if you're watching, have I got some asymmetric risk investments for you. From a video structure standpoint, I am breaking the video down into three sections. Randy's pros, his cons, and finally, a discussion, putting it all together and making recommendations. I also have a channel update for all my viewers that can be found after the conclusion at the end of the video, so stick around. As I personally prefer to start videos, let's talk positives. For starters, Costa's kick speed and dexterity are truly elite. He is not quite on Edison Barbosa's truly legendary level, but he absolutely exists in the tier directly below. Not only that, his hand speed is exemplary as well. It doesn't compare to his kicks, but it is absolutely above average and bordering on elite. Because of this, Costa is able to string together some unorthodox combos that wouldn't work for a fighter less physically gifted than himself. This unorthodox style leads him to possessing sneaky power. As I have detailed in prior videos, specifically my video on McGregor, I believe that power in MMA is defined by four characteristics that the heaviest hitters all possess to some degree. Deception, precision, speed, and finally, strength. Again, as I mentioned in my McGregor video, I rate all strikers on this scale, generally using a star system. Right now, I rate Costa two stars out of four with the potential for three star power. At present, Costa's speed represents a full star, meaning elite, half a star in strength. He has obvious stopping power, but not on the level of the elite bantamweights in this category, like O'Malley and Garbrandt, and Costa's deception represents the final half star. Costa's unorthodox striking angles are excellent, but inconsistent. In my opinion, Costa can bump his deception up, as well as his precision, to represent what I scout as his ceiling. Strength is one of those things you either have or you don't. Costa is never hitting with Francis level power, no matter how hard he trains. With power potential out of the way, let's dive into reasons I believe are the key to his existing physical talent and what information we can extrapolate from that. To me, the key to Costa's kick speed comes from the fluidity of his hips. Like Francis's Ford Escorts, what Costa has in the hip fluidity department is not teachable, but given to him by the grace of the MMA gods. As a brief aside, one thing I learned in my distant past aspirations to become a sports medicine physician, humans, and athletes more specifically, fall on a spectrum of joint stability. One can discern an athlete's joint stability by the injuries they incur, or in Costa's case, tape study. The two ends of the spectrum are loose or tight joints. Both have their positives and drawbacks. Loose joints are more likely to dislocate, but less likely to tear. You'll see this in more dislocated shoulders, but less torn labrums. Conversely, a tight joint is less likely to dislocate, but more likely to tear. In that case, you would see more torn labrums and less dislocated shoulders. Performance-wise, tight joints are generally correlated with increased muscle strength in athletes, but at the cost of flexibility. Think of those bodybuilders who can't pull the post-it note from their backs in the viral prank videos. Loose joints are often found in what is colloquially referred to as athletes with otter bodies like swimmers. Power potential is lower, but flexibility is correspondingly higher. This is in many ways an oversimplification, but context is important here and I am not a doctor. I just went to college on a pre-med trek and then didn't get into medical school. Take that how you will. No one falls completely on one side of the spectrum, but rather somewhere along the axis. We see this play out in MMA and fighters being able to hit certain submissions like triangles, omoplatas, and other lug-based submissions where they are higher on the loose side. And generally we see those with tighter joints being unable to hit certain submissions. But back to Costa it is very obvious he's on the loose side of the spectrum. Over time, he has learned how to really take advantage of this and combine it with his natural feel for whipping his hips through on kicks, leading to their speed and power. He shows the same ability with his punches, but not to the same degree. 
The difference is in his natural feel for exploiting those natural gifts in his kicks, while lacking some feel for whipping his shoulder through punches. Keep this in mind for later, but to wrap up this thought, we have yet to see Costa grapple on the ground in the UFC, but I have a feeling his fluidity will transfer especially well to bottom escapes and submissions. With the theoretical out of the way, let's dive into the practical and study the aforementioned round one versus Yanez to put pen to paper on my assertion that it was substantially better than commonly realized. To avoid making this video overly long, because I have a tendency to overwrite these scripts, I'm going to summarize the round with tape and provide data to add extra color. Diving in, Costa nearly lands more jabs in the first versus Yanez than in every other round of his career combined, 52 versus 61. To contextualize this, nearly 40% of his total career jab attempts are in just the first versus Yanez. What leapt off the screen in my study was just how electric and snappy Costa's jab was and how well he maintained his defensive fundamentals throughout it. Essentially, he was hitting Yanez while leaving little to no openings to strike back, aside from leg kicks on the exit. To me, this was the starting point to the key insight. Landing jabs is great, but why were these jabs so successful? Costa was using his jab incredibly well to back up Yanez and eat up the cage, absolutely pressuring the life out of Yanez. Adrian is a fantastic counterboxer, but the way Costa held up his defensive fundamentals nullified the counter and it was just an absolute downhill beating for most of the first. The key word I just used is most. Something starts to happen midway through the round. Costa is continuing to jab, but Yanez is not getting backed up as well anymore. Adrian is finding holes in Costa's guard and landing with greater and greater effect. The question that needs to be asked is binary. Is Costa tiring out and opening defensive holes that Yanez is exploiting? Or is there another issue that is being masked by visual exhaustion? Let's look at some data to lay the groundwork for the answers to this question. First off, let's look at Costa's jab lands and attempts minute by minute in the first. To read this graph, understand that each distinct time zone, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, represent the end of a minute. Time zone 1 represents the beginning bell to the 60th second. Time zone 2 represents the 61st second through the 120th of the round, and on and on. Noticeably, we see a pretty steep drop off in accuracy from the second to the third time zone going from 63.64% accuracy to 51.72%. Costa's volume stays roughly consistent, dropping only four jabs from 33 to 29 in that time period. That drop in accuracy is the harbinger for a drastic drop off in volume from the third to the fourth, and finally the fifth minute of the round, 29 to 19 to 10, with a coinciding drop off in accuracy. Costa seems to peak at the end of the second minute, but the drop off is slight and then very drastic. This point is particularly worrying. Noted non-cardio king Conor McGregor is generally able to sustain his offense through at least half of the second round, yet Costa is a full round behind that average. The drop off in output through the fourth and fifth minutes smells like a cardio issue to me, but I can't shake the feeling that there is something else here. An underlying issue can be easily misdiagnosed as a cardio problem and thus can't be fixed effectively. I should quickly mention here that from his first fight onward, Rogan has stuck to his guns that Costa has a serious cardio issue. He mentions it in every fight he covers of Costa. In my study of Costa's Instagram and articles with interviews, he has taken this to heart and is training his cardio vigorously. As we will come to see, even with this increased focus, he still has the same appearance of gassing out quickly. Something smells wrong to me there. So I believe we must leave the possibility of an underlying issue open and investigate further. Yanez is certainly adapting to Costa, but I believe that analysis of that is best left to my forthcoming video on Adrian. In my opinion, the adaptations point to what I truly believe is the issue, and to fully investigate that, we need to transition to the second round of this fight and begin the con section of this analysis. Round one ends with Adrian looking worse for wear, but the data we investigated foreshadows a worrying trend for Costa heading into the second. To dispel all the mystery I am intentionally writing in this script, I will put forth my theory on what the true underlying cause of Costa's regression is. Randy lacks a natural feel for distance management and is largely only successful when fighting his opponent downhill and wilts when they return pressure on him. But a theory is only a theory until proven. So let's look at some data and tape. To flesh this out more. In our data collection, we identify three striking situations which I will visualize on screen with respect to Costa and Adrian. First is center, where Costa strikes are thrown within the line of the cage. 
Second is exterior control, where Costa is throwing strikes while Yanez is beyond the line, denoting what we consider the exterior of the cage. And finally, exterior back foot, which is where Yanez instead of Costa occupies the control position, and Costa is beyond the exterior line when he throws his strikes. We can use this as a logical stand-in for who is controlling striking situations, center being neutral and the exterior denoting striking control or being controlled. With that out of the way, let's see the data. The image displays two pie charts, with the left being the first round and the right being the second round. The drop-off in control from the first to the second is huge, but doesn't really tell the whole story. Before I put a deeper breakdown on screen, let's refresh the concept of time zones. Each time zone represents the end of a minute in the round. As this fight ends within 7 minutes of cage time, the following graph has a pie chart for each time zone in order by minute. With out of the way, let's talk about how to interpret the key concept of the data. Read it from left to right, each pie chart representing the time zone. Mirroring the drop off we saw in jab output, Costa exerts greater control over the cage, peaking at the second minute and dropping a bit in the third, while still maintaining an edge over Yanez. Beginning in the fourth minute, we see a drastic drop off in the dark purple, meaning cage control, and a corresponding rise in the amount of time Yanez is controlling the cage. Into the fifth minute, we see the end of Costa's time in control of the cage and the rapid increase in pressure from Yanez through the sixth and seventh cage minute, leading ultimately to Costa's TKO loss. So let's put that jab output and the previous cage control data back on screen now. While not proving causation, meaning I'm not saying one is causing the other, it is very obviously correlated that Costa's inability to get off his jab is directly linked with his gradual loss of cage control. Bringing it back to my theory, we have to disprove the possibility that Costa is gassing to provide credence to my claim that he isn't managing distance well. On screen is a simple display of Costa's overall striking output by time zone. We see that in the fourth minute he threw more strikes than in the first, and in the sixth he tied his overall output in the first. The seventh minute was now a full minute but the fifth minute of the fight does indeed show a drop in output. I would not feel comfortable saying it disproves cardio as the primary factor, but I think it pours a serious amount of cold water on that theory. So to summarize this data concisely, in the first round, Costa threw 36% of his strikes while in control of the cage, whereas in the second, 0%. Conversely, in the first round, Costa threw 8% of his strikes when Yanez controlled the cage. In the second, that jumps to 60%. To crystallize the logic of my theory, if Costa lacks the ability to maintain the fight at the distance he wants to strike at, we should observe a multitude of effects theoretically, but in practical tape terms, we have two main ones. Yanez adapting to how Costa was pressuring him and reversing it leading to a collapse in Costa's offense, and mounting damage leading to a decrease in output from damage exhaustion, or conversely, a pressure striking game plan to open up clinch grappling situations to wear on Costa's gas tank. To really put the final cherry on top of my theory, we need to jump to Costa's next fight with Tony Kelly, where we see that second option. So Tony Kelly is nowhere near the striking talent of Yanez, but against Costa, that wasn't entirely necessary. By using a pressure boxing style with kicks mixed in, Kelly was able to force Costa to initiate clinch situations to relieve the striking pressure, or Kelly was able to initiate them himself, and in both cases, the stronger Kelly was able to land damage and dominate these exchanges. A multitude of clinch knees to the gut and some plum clinch work drains Costa's reserves through damage and the strength disparity leading to a second round submission of an exhausted Costa. Not as much data in this one because Kelly immediately came out with pressure and dominated every second of this relatively short fight. Costa was never able to get his striking going, which would theoretically, to Rogan's point, lead him to gassing out from overexertion for sheer volume. Kelly was able to have his way with Costa striking distance and smothered him with little to no punishment in return. In my opinion, these two fights together demonstrate that the primary issue for Costa is not his gas tank, but his inability to fend off pressure and maintain his striking distance. When Costa is able to maintain his distance, he shows few signs of gas tank issues. These issues only crop up when he begins to receive pressure and lacks the footwork, arsenal, or cage awareness to reestablish his offense. Granted. Costa could have an issue with his cardio, but in my opinion, improvements to his distance management would likely cause the cardio issue to dissipate entirely, proving that the Achilles heel was distance rather than cardio the entire time. So let's summarize and wrap this up. Any discussion of Costa's talent has to start with the trade-off of his distance issues compared to his near elite physical tools at bantamweight. 
Clinch grappling and Yanez's in-cage adaptation both come from the same issue, range management. Fighters stronger than him like Kelly can exploit the distance issues to overpower in the clinch and gas to an attrition victory. Fighters with strong natural striking talent can go the Yanez path and steadily back him up and pick him apart with his back to the cage. Expanding our horizon on Costa to his broad tangible skills, we can start to deconstruct the issue and plan solutions. Herein lies the tweaks the title refers to. For starters, Costa is an incredibly round fighter. What I mean is he throws strikes wide to trade off strike speed for added power. What does that mean? An axiom in striking is straight punches beat round ones. What this means is that a straight punch will hit their target faster than a round one, like a hook, when thrown at the same time. It's basic geometry, shorter distance to travel. But, rounded strikes allow for greater striking power due to the utilization of more, larger muscles like the pec and anterior deltoid. So the trade-off is speed versus power. Again, but, if a fighter has near elite hand speed, the equation gets altered some. Here's a simple math problem to explain it. If fighter A throws a jab and it takes 1.5 seconds to land compared to 2 seconds for their hook, but fighter B can throw their hook in just under 1.5 seconds, the axiom from before is broken. Fighter B can derive more average power while landing at a slightly faster speed than the straight punch. There are tons of factors that can poke holes in my prior equation, but understand this is a hypothetical. Costa is essentially Fighter B. Costa can round his strikes in a way that increase their power and his natural hand speed offsets the losses one would expect in the speed to landing. Therein lies the greatest key to his potential. When Costa wins, it is universally when this equation tips heavily in his balance. Against Yanez, his utilization of a straight jab led to him beating Yanez on hand speed and landing with consistent damage leading to facial injury. As Yanez learned to exploit Costa's range issues, the hand speed differential shortened because Adrian was able to maintain a closer striking distance, thus his strikes had less distance to travel, and Adrian's natural punching power superiority led to Costa consistently losing these exchanges, absorbing more and more damage. Had Costa been able to maintain his peak distance, he would have likely finished Adrian, or cruised to a decision victory. So we have isolated the issue. Now we must leverage data, tape, from our prior analysis to build a solution set. Concurrently, I am also working on a video on Cyril Ghosn to come out the week of his main event for Tai Tuivasa, so his arsenal is on my brain. Cyril is the most elite distance manager at heavyweight, and arguably at light heavyweight as well when Izzy isn't fighting there. So let's take a moment to compare their arsenals against each other for some leading context. Of their total recorded strikes, 12% of Costa's are kicks, of some kind, compared to 36.5% for Gan. This shows that Gan is more kick heavy, which to me is roughly half of the reason his distance management is so dominant, but more on that in my Gan video. If we accept my previous assertion that Gan's kicks are a big key to his distance management, then we should recommend to Costa to kick more. But wait, we can go deeper. Kicks alone don't manage distance. Specific kick types are great at it, however. For context's sake, here is tape of each of the four types of kicks we will discuss with their names clearly labeled. So let's see what Gan throws, how often, and compare it to Costa. Voila. It's a bit smushed on Gan's rear foot chart, but there is a tiny sliver that refers to spinning kicks at a rate of 3.04%. Once we break out the kicks by type, the disparity becomes much clearer. Costa almost universally throws round kicks, which are much more damaging than the others, but don't naturally reinforce range. From Cyril's data, we see that on average 20% of his kicks are front kicks, which serve to duly damage opponents as well as reinforce his striking range. Surreal also loves to fight out of open stance, which we can see in his high usage of lead leg sidekicks that he predominantly targets to the lead thigh of his opponent, another great distance manager. Before we go too far down this road, I can hear the science junkies in the audience wanting to see sample sizes. On screen, you can see them now. Granted, Surreal has substantially more cage time and thus a correspondingly higher number of overall kicks. I would argue that we have enough evidence that Costa is highly round kick dominant considering he has thrown two front kicks in his career compared to 41 round kicks. So data aside, what's my point? 
I prior described Costa's truly elite kick speed. I outlined his difficulties managing range. I showed data of a borderline savant of range management in Surreal and his kick repertoire that contributes heavily to producing those results. What does this add up to? Costa needs to drill front kicks for days on end. He needs to practice their utility in live sparring to get a real feel for their use. Then he needs to bring them to the cage. Front kicks, and by extension the lead leg sidekick, are the key tweak to his game that I predict will catapult him to top 10 at bantamweight. Costa already likes to experiment with open stance. Take a page out of Gon's book and use the lead leg sidekick to punish plotters like Kelly. Snap some front kicks Adrian's way when he uses his slick footwork to enter range, punishing him while re-establishing the distance Costa needs to be successful. My final tweak. Costa loves to throw naked lead high kicks. When I say naked, I mean that he does not set them up with punches. I personally don't like them, but don't have a data basis to prove that he should remove them. Instead, I think that Costa should use them at the end of his 1-2, especially from open stance, to really dig to the body of his opponents. If Rogan is right and he indeed has a cardio issue, round kicks to the body and front kicks to the gut will help sap the opponent's gas tank and help to level the playing field. If I am correct and he has an average gas tank, even better, now they're at the disparity. The incorporation of the front kick, drilling distance management ad nauseum, and maybe sprinkling in some lead round kick damage at the end of his punching combos would be a game changer for Costa and would not be a massive overhaul to what he is already doing. So to wrap this baby up, I believe Costa is a few tweaks away from top 10 contention at bantamweight. Costa's natural talent lends itself to developing highly effective solutions to his greatest weakness. By looking at a fire like Surreal, who establishes exceptional range, we have a model for the way that Costa needs to adapt. Watching his fights, I think Costa could absolutely implement these changes and really prove to the world just how talented he is. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, as promised, here's a quick channel update. In the background, we've been expanding our data resources, which is why I've been off for the last four months or so. The data you saw in this video represents that expansion. We now have a catalog of every strike thrown by Costa, among a few others. More data means more insights. More insights means longer production cycles, though. Going forward, my goal is a video every two weeks, the next being a video on Cyril Ghosn the week of his fight. Coming soon will be breakdowns of O'Malley, Adrian Yanez, and other fighters I know the community will be excited about. I also want to talk quickly about Patreon. I would love some comments on how to make our Patreon worthwhile. What kind of content would you like? What kind of things would interest you? With changes to the production schedule, I'll be able to upload earlier to Patreon, so I could provide a link to see videos early there. Would that be valuable? I could also offer a production slot, so I will do a video on whatever fighter is voted on by patrons or something like that. We also have the data sheets detailing standardized data breakdowns of fighters on that week's cards, which could be valuable if wanted by the community. I could post those, just let me know. I could also do Twitch streams where I work on the data. It could just be a fun open forum for patrons to talk MMA. I spend a lot of time doing analysis on the data, visualizing it, making changes, deciding what's uh, the most efficient way to show the data, are there other questions that need to be answered by that data, context, etc. So uh, I think it'd be fun to do a Twitch stream, have a couple people in there, we're all talking at the same time. So if that's something that interests you guys, uh, let me know. All in all, see you guys in two weeks with my breakdown of Serial Gone.